So we're very fortunate to have Cal Kremer here as our first plenary speaker. So Cal is a professor in data science at New York University. He's an experimental particle physicist working at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. So Cal is known for many things, including for developing a framework for collaborative statistical modeling, which was used for the discovery of the Higgs boson. Cal is also very active in simulation-based inference, and he's thinking deeply about how to incorporate physical insight into machine learning architectures. So the topic of today's talk will be explorations at the physics AI interface. Uh, so Cal, please go ahead. Great, thank you very much for having me. Um, okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Hopefully you can see fine. Um, great, so um, exactly. So I'm gonna be talking about these uh, explorations uh, you know, at the interface of physics and uh, AI. Um, I'd like to first start by thanking my collaborators. Over the last few years, I've been working with a, you know, just a, a very fun group of uh, physicists and statisticians, machine learning researchers, and applied mathematicians. Um, and it's allowed me to kind of dabble in, in several different topics. And uh, I've, you know, I've really been enjoying myself. Um, so, um, in terms of the, you know, my last few years of work, the you know, I've really, you know, more than any time in my life, worked on a, a very diverse set of topics. And so here are just, you know, some of them, uh, but you see things that are related to the LHC, like working on what are called uh, uh, jets, uh, these objects that you see at the, at the LHC with the tree and graph-based neural networks, uh, working on simulation-based inference approaches for doing precision measurements, uh, uh, extended away from the LHC to work on, a, uh, do a little bit of work related to uh, dark matter and, uh, and astrophysics. Um, played on the kind of uh, methodological side with probabilistic programming, uh, started to work in some more theoretical physics topics like uh, modeling the quantum density matrix and even uh, lattice field theory, and then doing some work with, uh, you know, dynamical systems, trying to understand how to use uh, different kinds of uh, graph-based neural networks and things related to, you know, differential equations and things like this. And, uh, and so you can see it's kind of a, a little bit of a smattering. So you could ask, you know, what do all of these projects have in common? Um, and so I think, you know, many of them are aimed at important physics questions, which, you know, so I am still a physicist interested in, in, in uh, you know, uh, improving things. Uh, but also many of these are explorations to improve, you know, our understanding, or at least my understanding of the pros and cons of the different approaches that we have to modeling and inference uh, related to, you know, science and AI and things like this. And they're roughly two extremes, which I'll talk about, you know, one or more traditional physics-based approaches, which emphasize like a mechanistic underlying physical model or mechanistic model. And others are more black box machine learning approaches, which emphasize, you know, function approximation and prediction. And so this exploration, you know, has led to some, you know, I think interesting insights into AI and ML. Um, and they've also refined, you know, my thinking about physics and to some extent, you know, some kind of philosophy of science questions. Um, so the abstract that I have for today is that instead of focusing on one specific application, I'm going to try to discuss a few different projects that, you know, around this exploration um, and with the theme, which is, you know, largely about how do we incorporate our physical insight into the underlying, you know, causal mechanism as physicists into the inductive bias of machine learning architectures. Uh, ask the question, you know, is that helpful or necessary? You know, when is that necessary? Um, why do I care if a model is interpretable? Um, in some sense, I'm kind of interested, you know, where do we stand on the spectrum between having, you know, kind of a machine learning supercharged data analysis, which we definitely have now, uh, and somewhere between there and some long-term vision of a, you know, AI robot scientist or something. And how does all of this sort of influence research and AI and ML uh, as opposed to just uh, influencing physics. Um, so the two you know, big players, I would say, in this uh, story are you know, the theory and the data. Um, and related to that are the kind of two directions, the kind of prediction direction and the inference direction. Um, and you know, if you go back in time, the traditional approaches in physics, in physics have uh, involved you know, a lot of handcrafted data analysis techniques. They've largely been guided by expert knowledge and theoretical insights. And so that's kind of the pendulum on one side. And then uh, the pendulum you know, swung quite uh, far to the other side, um, maybe you know, peaking with uh, big data and deep learning. Um, and there, the, you know, the message has largely been to try to sort of eschew feature engineering, uh, focus on end-to-end -end learning, uh, 
And there's this idea of trying to make everything be data-driven uh, with a kind of uh, almost implicit understanding that being data-driven is, is good uh, while being like theoretically driven is bad. Uh, um, and, um, and so you saw, you know, kind of when big data was uh, uh, the, 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 the term of the day that, uh, uh, you know, articles like this, the end of theory, how the data deluge makes the scientific method obsolete. You see quotes uh, like this, uh, you know, riffing off of the, uh, the the quote that all models are wrong, and uh, but some are useful. Is this one's uh, all models are wrong, and increasingly you can succeed without them, from Peter Norvig at, at Google, basically focusing again on uh, you know the, how data can basically solve all your problems. Um, now, if you look at uh, this, is a workshop that was held at IPAM uh, in, in 2019, and it was you know co-organized co by. Uh, sort of physicists and you know uh, and well some you know, some chemists and uh, and deep learning researchers, and I'll just uh, quite you know quote a few things from the overview. So one is basically talking about you know the potential for machine learning, uh, both for you know, data from experiments or from simulations, uh, and I think that's important to keep in mind that you know many theoretical types of questions. There's a lot of computational work, which doesn't involve like real experiments, where machine learning is still very useful. Um, the ability of mach machine learning to help us like interrogate high dimensional complex data in a way that was not possible before. I think we can probably all agree that that's, that's happening. Uh, and then it extends, and here you see, you know, like the kind of wish list of what the organizers have in mind that, you know, we believe that machine learning will also provide exciting opportunity to learn the models themselves. That is to be able to learn the physical principles and structures underlying the data. And now that's interesting because, uh, you know, I mean, if you could do that, that would be great. Uh, but you know, this is a, it's a bit of a, a leap here and I'll come back to this kind of thing is, you know, can, can we actually do that? That's starting to get more into this uh, robot scientist. Um, and then you also uh, have this other point that, you know, for physicists that we'd also not to like, you'd like to not only fit the data, but to have models that are somehow interpretable or uh, understandable um, and that can relate back to the kind of underlying laws in some way. So. So here you see the desires of the scientists to be able to have things that are interpretable and to try, try to get to that underlying mechanism, which is not necessarily keeping with this kind of uh, fully blown uh, data driven, um, you know, black box type of approach. So now I'd like to just uh, make this point that in science, if you look about like what's going on in the state of the art, you know, uh, throughout science, you see simulators all over the place. Um, you see simulators for very small scale uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, like uh, like we have at particle colliders, um, you see uh, uh, simulators for you know neuronal activity, uh, how epidemics spread, which has been very you know important recently. Um, you see simulators for the evolution of the universe at large, uh, how molecules and proteins fold, how airplanes fly, and you know how black holes uh, uh, you know accrete uh, mass around them and and etc. So. These simulators are all over the place, and oftentimes they they represent really our highest fidelity understanding of whatever phenomena that we're we're interested in, and they can generate very high fidelity data. Um, and also the simulators, they're not just generating data that you know that happens to look like the real data. They they have a causal mechanism inside of them. Okay, so that uh, so I call them uh, you know causal generative models. And as we'll see in a second, uh, oftentimes these uh, simulators are also what you might refer to as an implicit model, uh, which I'll, I'll describe in a second. It basically means that you know, they're hard to work with in a particular way. Now, this is that same uh, sort of setting that I showed before, but just with some, uh, some notation. So I'm gonna use generically X to describe the data, which is either observed data or synthetic data from the simulator. Um, I'm going to use theta to describe the parameters of my simulation that I care about inferring, which might be like the mass of a particle or a fundamental constant about, uh, you know, a, a cosmological constant or something. Um, I may also have nuisance parameters, which I don't necessarily care about inferring, but they're going to uh, um, affect the distribution of the data. So they might be a calibration constant in my detector or something, you know, something about a noise model somewhere. Um, and then my simulator, my simulator, which is representing my, you know, my predictions, uh, also inside of it will typically have a lot of latent variables. There are things that are like random variables that represent, you know, maybe, you know, meaningful things like a particle decaying or interacting inside of my detector, but there are things that I don't directly get to observe in the data. So, so that's why they're referred to as, as latent variables. And the simulator you can think of conceptually as describing the probability distribution for the observed data and the latent variables given the parameters of interest and the nuisance parameters. 
And then my goal is based on some observed data is I'm going to want to you know, invert this situation and try to uh, make some you know, uh, inferential statement about the parameters of interest. Um, and, and, uh, and that's you know, just typical you know, inference in the scientific context. Now, often the data is high dimensional and it'll be difficult to work with. So oftentimes what we've done to deal with that is to think about what are some particular aspects of the data that are going to be useful for trying to infer the parameters of interest. And those are just generically called summary statistics. They're kind of like engineered features. Um, and uh, you know, different fields have different jargon terms that they use to refer to these kind of observables that are going to be uh, calculated from the high dimensional data and sort of useful for whatever task that you're interested in. So here's a toy example of some system that you might want to simulate. It's just, a, you know, you've seen these kinds of desk toys before, I'm sure. Um, so you, you, you flip it over and the balls go through this lattice of nails and they end up somewhere at the bottom. And, and you could imagine that instead of it just being a fixed model, like maybe it's I can tilt the thing slightly to the left or to the right to, to bias the probability that you bounce to the left or to the right. And, and, and that I could imagine calling that parameter theta that I want to infer uh, by looking at the where the balls uh, end. And I'm going to think about basically the path that they took through this trellis of nails as the latent variables and where they end up as the observable x. Um, and you might think, okay, well, this is an easy one. Um, you know, they either bounce to the left or the right with some probability, you know, theta. Um, and so that's a binomial distribution. And, uh, and here it is. Um, and, you know, kind of more fundamentally, this, uh, this distribution for where they ended, you can think of as being having marginalizing over all the possible paths that the uh, that the that the uh, balls might have taken as they go through this lattice of nails and that's what the, these latent variables z and, and so the reason that you know this is a binomial probability distribution is because you can just literally do this sum analytically because it you know has it's a you know relatively simple sum it just has some combinatorics associated to it but the problem is, and you learn well, I learned the painful way when giving a, a lecture about this to my undergraduates is that this uh, is not a binomial distribution. Um, and if you look in, you know, closely, you can see the balls are bouncing around all sorts of crazy ways. Uh, sometimes they run into each other, sometimes they skip over two or three nails. Um, and so this is not a binomial distribution. So you know, what, there's also some issue about the pitch of these bins and how they uh, align with the pitch of the nails uh, that gives you some weird uh, aliasing effects and things. So it's complicated. I have no idea what the distribution is, but I could simulate it. And so together with a friend of mine, uh, Junius Biden, uh, we you know, put together a simple simulator for this uh, situation. Again, you see the latent variables, you see the observables X. And the main point of this is that if you wanted to describe this probability distribution, you know, the same equation applies. The problem is I can't, there's no trick that I can use to try to calculate this integral uh, uh, analytically, I need to basically do it by brute force, some numerical procedure. And uh, as the latent space grows, that integral becomes more and more challenging. Um, and eventually it becomes intractable. There's basically, you're just not going to be able to do this integral in practice. Um, so that means that the likelihood function uh, is intractable. And that's what makes this a so-called implicit model. Um, but the, so, you know, so the question is going to be, how am I going to do inference in a situation like this? Um, so the likelihood is intractable, but I can still run the simulator and generate synthetic observations. So that's kind of the, the setting. So simulation-based inference is this kind of uh, overarching term. Some, it's been, the you know, more common term was uh, likelihood-free inference, but I don't, I don't really like that term uh, for a number of reasons. So I, I prefer this term simulation-based inference. And it has the basic setup that you have some parameters. Your simulator is essentially a black box with some latent variables inside. Uh, the, the black box does have some kind of mechanism, uh, you know, that's relevant for your, your, your field. It produces some synthetic observations X, and that's the forward model, the predictive model, uh, or the generative model for the data. And now we would like to invert that generative model and do inference on the parameters data. Now, <clears throat> this connection to machine learning and AI uh, is, is interesting. This is part of the reason for using this term implicit is that in the kind of machine learning sphere, uh, you know, I'm sure you all heard of generative adversarial networks or GANs that produce these like uh, faces, you know, images of people's faces or and things like that for people that never existed. Um, so they are generative models and they are also implicit models in the sense that they can generate, you know, fake images, but you can't evaluate the likelihood of some new uh, image because that's uh, uh, too, too difficult of a computation essentially. Um, and they, in, in this workshop uh, that was held at ICML, it points out that you know, these implicit models are, are relevant for modeling all sorts of uh, phenomena. They have this intractable density. 
Um, and uh, so for instance, for particle physics, and then they point to various kind of uh, contemporary machine learning topics like GANs, variational inference, uh, approximate Bayesian computation, et cetera, et cetera, which are relevant topics uh, you know, related to this. Um, and so there's been a lot of activity in the last few years on this, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention a little bit of it. Uh, but uh, uh, now a couple of years ago, uh, uh, Gilles Loup and Johan Brimmer and I wrote a kind of uh, review article roughly about uh, what we call the frontiers of simulation-based inference with sort of traditional approaches sitting down here, basically restricted to working with simulators that are, you know, relatively, you know, relatively inexpensive and without too high uh, dimensionality for the thing that you're trying to infer, whether it be theta or the latent variables themselves, um, and then also restricted to relatively low dimensional data. And what we're seeing is that machine learning is allowing us to work with higher dimensional data. Uh, things like active learning are allowing us to work with more expensive simulators or to be able to do inference in higher dimensions. And then there are some tricks that I'll talk about, which uh, kind of uh, under the umbrella of integration and augmentation, where you, you open up the black box of the simulator and you, you, you augment it or you integrate it with some, some other techniques and they kind of move roughly in this diagonal direction. Okay, <clears throat> now I could you know, give a whole talks about simulation-based inference, but I wanna kind of get to some other points. So I'm just gonna give a quick overview. Um, I would, there's a rough taxonomy. I would say that like roughly there are two approaches, uh, some that use the simulator directly for inference. Um, and so that's sort of like approximate Bayesian computation, uh, various probabilistic programming techniques I would put in this category. There's a technique we developed called adversarial variational optimization, which is sort of like a GAN, but it allows, us, allows you to work with a non-differentiable simulator. Um, so those are some approaches. And then there are other approaches that use, you know, primarily deep learning to learn some sort of surrogate that relate, you know, to tell you the relationship between the data and the parameters. Um, and there, there are a few approaches. One is to use this so-called likelihood ratio trick, where you use, for instance, class classifiers to learn a likelihood ratio. I'll talk about that in a second. There are approaches where you try to do conditional density estimate, uh, estimation, where either sort of learning the distribution of the data condition on the parameters or vice versa. Uh, and there, things like normalizing flows are being used uh, effectively. And then there are some approaches where you use machine learning to essentially learn a summary statistic that's going to be powerful for your particular question. Um, so, you know, those are roughly, you know, roughly the approaches. And here's a schematic of one of them is that you've got uh, the simulator here. Now you're going to tell the simulator to run with some value of the parameters theta. It's going to generate some synthetic data X. And then you're going to train a neural network with an appropriate loss function. And the goal is that it's going to try to approximate a likelihood ratio. And this function, this neural network, takes in as, uh, as input both the observed data and the unknown value of the parameters. So this, uh, and, and so this likelihood ratio depends on both of those. So once you have some observed data, you put that there, and then you can scan around the parameters theta, and you can do statistical inference. And you can, uh, if you want, you can also calibrate these like confidence intervals and things because you can always generate more data from the simulator. Now, um, in this kind of approach, this neural network um, you know, it, it's either learning, say, a likelihood or a likelihood ratio. Um, and in and, and this kind of setting, it's a, it's a, you refer to it as an amortized approach because you pay upfront the cost of training this neural network uh, with, you know, generating a bunch of synthetic data and training the network. And once you've trained the neural network, then inference is pretty fast. Okay, so that's why you have this upfront training cost that's amortized for fast inference later on. Um, and so in these approaches, I talked about kind of the likelihood ratio based approaches and the uh, likelihood based approaches corresponding to that are whether or not you primarily used supervised learning approaches or unsupervised learning approaches. Um, and, uh, you know, there's more details here, but I'm not going to go into them deeply for this talk. Um, so that's kind of like roughly the, you know, the, the, the capability that's coming about now that I think is very uh, interesting and powerful. So that's sort of the what. Um, I'll give a couple of examples and then I'll, and then I'll get a, a little bit into the how. So one example has to do with uh, particle physics uh, data. So here's a, you know, very high dimensional uh, data that you see at, uh, at a, you know, like the LHC. Um, and here is the, you know, symbolic form of the standard model, which is the theory that we would like to be able to test. Um, and it has a few coefficients, which are the things that you would want to measure. Um, and, uh, and so these are the parameters theta um, that, that you would like to measure. And uh, once you know them, you might have seen things like Feynman diagrams. That, you know, that describes the sort of quantum, mechanic, quantum mechanical scattering of like, you know, high energy collisions of particles. So these are like quarks, uh, 
uh, that are scattering from two beams of protons. They, they interact in the following way. And then the stuff on the right here is the stuff that comes flying out into the detector. Um, and, but the problem is that we don't observe this directly. Um, uh, so there, there's some latent variables here, which are the energy and momentum of these particles, but we don't observe them uh, because the, if you have things like quarks, they radiate more particles in this thing that's called a parton shower. So you get this more complicated uh, thing going on. So uh, here, there's a relatively simple rule that's happening at every splitting, but because there's so many splittings, you're, you're not going to really write it down with a pencil and paper anymore. So here you move things onto a computer and you're able to simulate uh, this type of uh, parton shower with, with a simulator. Uh, and these, these particles then come flying out to uh, hit our detectors. Uh, and then we have to model the interaction of those particles with our detectors. And that's where you introduce usually the most latent variables. Uh, these detectors are you know, the size of buildings. Um, they have very high energy particles hitting them. Uh, they, you know, they go through and they radiate and ionize and do all the things that they do. Um, and when you simulate one of these collisions, you know, you may have of order 100 million latent variables to simulate just one collision uh, at the LHC. And then once you have this synthetic data, then you can put it into the format of what we actually observe, uh, you know, where you're actually talking about the response of the electronics to that, that, you know, that whole process that I just described. So that's the evolution of this generative model. You can see there's a very strong mechanistic causal story that's being told and that goes from the parameters all the way to the data. Um, and we have the different tools that are responsible for these different parts of the simulation chain. Conceptually, they describe these different concept, uh, conditional probabilities. Um, and we sample them with Monte Carlo procedures, which you can think of conceptually as trying to approximate this big integral. Okay, and so if you wanted to actually calculate the likelihood of the observable, uh, given the parameters, you would have to do this enormous, enormous integral, and that's just never going to happen you know, in our lifetimes. As I, as, uh, so the uh, so this is very difficult. So now um, uh, and so that's why this is a you know a, a simulation based inference uh, problem. Um, so here's an example that we that we studied. It's a particular you know type of uh, extension of the standard model where you have a collision that involves the Higgs boson. And what we want to do is modify how the Higgs boson interacts with these W and Z particles. And so that's what so the new physics is happening at these red vertices. That's where the interaction will look a little different. Um, and it's parameterized by this, you know, quantum field theory operators. And the important point is that there are two real valued coefficients that we would like to measure. And if they're both zero, it's the standard model. And if either one of them is non-zero, it's uh, signs of uh, physics beyond the standard model, which would be very exciting. Um, now, the data that we're working with in this example, we worked with, we took the energy and momentum of these particles. Um, and, and uh, various other kind of redundant variables. And so we were working with sort of 42 dimensional data describing the collision. Um, and then we applied the procedures like uh, you know, I've been describing and we showed that for a simple situation where we can still evaluate the true likelihood that we can estimate it uh, very well. And so even when we're working with this kind of 42 dimensional data, this is a scatter plot and you see we're learning, we're estimating the true likelihood very accurately. And then this is a log likelihood curve uh, where the horizontal axis is the parameter we want to measure. Zero is the standard model. And, and what you would like to see is this log likelihood curve be as narrow as possible. That's a more precise measurement. And you see that going from traditional approaches to these kind of uh, you know, neural network based simulation based inference techniques, uh, we have a, a more narrow uh, log likelihood curve, which maybe doesn't look striking, but it's cor it corresponds to adding about 90% more LHC data. So this is like really a, a very substantial improvement in sensitivity. Um, this is a different example. It's a slightly different interaction, but it's the same basic setup. Um, and here we have two parameters that we'd like to measure. Uh, again, zero is the standard model. And the traditional uh, analysis techniques that are being uh, you know, uh, pursued right now give you this dashed line. And what we would like is the most precise measurements possible. So we'd like this contour to be smaller. And if we use these, these kinds of simulation based simulation based inference techniques that I described, you get to the blue contour, which is, you know, substantially more precise and corresponds to like many more fact, uh, many factors of more LHC data. Um, so this is kind of, you know, what you're getting from using these techniques. Um, I'll quickly show another example that has to do with dark matter. Uh, here's a galaxy. The galaxy is surrounded by a halo of dark matter. The halo of dark matter is not perfectly smooth, it's clumpy, and that's what these little blue blobs are. These are clumps of dark matter are called dark matter subhalos. And the mass of those subhalos follows a kind of power law, fractal-like distribution. 
And here's a, an example of the, the subhalo mass distribution. So this is the mass of the subhalo, and this is the, the number density. And you see here that the distribution of that, uh, you know, this is the predicted distribution for these, uh, this, the mass of these subhalos depends on the particle nature of the dark matter. So, you know, you have this very large scale phenomena, the size of, you know, galaxies, that depends on the microphysics of the mass of the dark matter particle. So here you see, you know, depending on uh, the mass of the particle that you get this kind of cutoff. Okay, so if we could measure this, uh, this, this, uh, this mass distribution, uh, then that would be great. We would have some, maybe some indirect evidence of what's going on with the particle nature of dark matter, but we don't see the dark matter subhalos, right? That's kind of the, the ultimate latent variable. So, so what do you do? Well, one thing that you can do is employ this technique called gravitational lensing, where you have a foreground galaxy uh, that's uh, bending the light from a, a background galaxy. So the, the light from this background galaxy gets uh, bent due to general relativity. And you get you can get these you know very dramatic uh, arc uh, you know arcs uh, these these lensed images, and the idea is that this the, this uh, this uh, lensed uh, uh, background galaxy is distorted and and it, the you know DV, you know little deformations in this image are encoding all sorts of things about the dark matter substructure in the foreground, um, and so if you could statistically analyze this, you might be able to learn something. So we did a proof of principle. This is a, you know, a simplified uh, uh, setup, but it is, again, it's a proof of principle. But the, the point is that we want to infer the population level parameters. We don't really care where the individual subhalos are. We want to, we care about the power law of this distribution and the normalization. Okay, so that's beta and F sub here. Um, so once we, if we, if we uh, you know, fix the values of those parameters, then we can sample uh, dark matter subhalos, those are the little blue dots that are located around some uh, foreground galaxy. Then we can run the simulator of, of how gravitational lensing works. And then we can model the uh, detector response, the point spread function of, uh, of some telescope, add in you know, Poisson shot noise from the photons arriving. And we can get a uh, sort of synthetic images that look like this. And again, this is a simplified you know, simulation chain, but it has the, the basic ingredients. Um, now, this is a fairly high dimensional observation. It's sort of 64 squared uh, dimensional. Um, and so, uh, but based on that, we would like to try to go backwards and see if we have several of these infer the population level parameters. So we trained one of these uh, surrogates to, to uh, like I described before, uh, with a, a neural network. And it's an amortized setup. So as the images come in, we can update, in this case, a posterior distribution. And you see over here on the right, the posterior concentrating as the images come in around the true value that was generate, used to generate this synthetic mock data set. Um, and so that was a, you know, I think it's a pretty cool, you know, proof of, proof of principle of what kinds of things you could do uh, with a simulation chain like this. And, you know, implicitly it's, it's marginalizing, you never like explicitly marginalize over all these latent variables in the simulation chain. You just learn the relationship between the observed data and the parameters. Um, another example that I'll just flash is uh, um, in, the, in the context of gravitational wave astronomy, where you see, you know, a gravitational wave comes by and you, you can run a, a, you know, a, a, you know, a fairly expensive uh, uh, inference, you know, MCMC inference uh, thing to try to say, you know, where did on the sky did this come or there are various faster algorithms. Here, it's using the same kind of uh, procedures that I talked about to, uh, to very quickly get a you know, probability distribution on the sky of where that event came from so that you could you know, tell telescopes and things to do some follow-up observation. And because this is amortized, it's very, very fast. Um, so anyways, there, there are many more examples. And uh, I think uh, Francois and uh, Ben Vendel will be talking about uh, uh, more things along these lines later in the, in the conference. Uh, but I would just like to now take stock about kind of what does this mean? So I think, um, you know, if you keep track of the fact that these simulators are based on some, you know, well-motivated mechanistic model, and oftentimes that mechanistic model is like a low-level kind of thing where you have lots of interactions between all the ingredients, and that kind of generically gives rise to these intractable inverse problems, uh, then that's just like it's a pretty fundamental problem you're going to run into in science, right? And so to me, the, the important thing that's happening is that the developments in machine learning have the potential to effectively bridge the, the macroscopic, microscopic divide, uh, 
where you have effective statistical models that describe the sort of macroscopic emergent phenomena that you see in the data back to the low level microscopic reductionist model that you use inside the simulator. And so this is, I think, a very important kind of uh, ability to have, you know, for the scientific community. And it's really advancing very rapidly right now. Okay, so that was the what. And now let's talk uh, briefly about the how before going to the, the why. So um, in terms of the how, I'm going to just quickly give you a flavor about how some of this stuff works. Um, and what I want you to notice as I'm talking about it is that I'm going to be totally agnostic to the architectures of these neural networks. Um, I'm not going to you know, say anything about what kind of neural networks I'm using. And so that kind of prompts the question like, do I actually care about the architectures of, of these networks? Um, so the way this, this way of thinking about things, I think, is, is quickly summarized by thinking of machine learning is essentially applied calculus of variations. So for the physicists, uh, you probably solve some problems about like the shape of soap bubbles between two rings. And when you do this, uh, you, you try to find the surface, uh, you know, the shape of the surface that minimizes the area or minimizes the energy of the, of the system. Uh, and so it's a calculus of variations problem. And the way that I think of a lot of machine learning is essentially, uh, you know, applied calculus of variations in the sense that you can define some, in, in principle, you can define some loss uh, functional that you like to minimize. Um, and you would like, in principle, to do it over the space of all functions. Um, and, uh, and so for that, you would use calculus of variations, but that's gonna be difficult uh, in practice. So in practice, you're going to introduce some very flexible uh, parameterized set of models. And so I'm calling that S sub phi. And then you're going to you know, minimize with respect to that family of models with the hope that the, you know, the, the sort of best, mo best model in that family is going to be a good approximation of the kind of ideal calculus of variations uh, solution. And then you can think of neural networks as essentially a very flexible family of functions. And that comes with a very, um, machine learning also provides this like very powerful set of non-convex optimization algorithms that allow you to like actually, you know, implement this effectively. Um, so that's one way of looking, you know, at machine learning, and it's not a totally crazy way. I, I, I posted this on Facebook, and Jan LeCun responded that, you know, basically he agreed that this is a, a reasonable way to think about, uh, you know, machine learning. So, um, anyways, the uh, so if you if you take that, you know, point of view in mind, and then you look at this is from the review article, the bottom row here were approaches to simulation based inference that use like deep learning based surrogates. And as I mentioned before, you have approaches that use super, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So let's just look really quick into like one of the supervised approaches. Um, in the end, it basically just boils down to like a very kind of elementary uh, thing about binary classification. So if you wanted to just classify red dots and blue dots or cats versus dogs or signal versus background, um, you, you, you have, you know, you can, and you can provide a bunch of examples. Um, you know, how would you go about doing it in principle? In principle, you could consider a particular loss functional, which I'm writing out explicitly is like the expectations with respect to uh, the two different distributions, the, the red and the blue. Uh, and in practice, I don't have access to the, the distributions for the red and the blue. I only have training data. Uh, but let's just imagine that I had access to the underlying distribution. Then this is a particular loss functional that I could consider. It's called the cross entropy. And then I could uh, just explicitly use calculus of variations to find a function S that minimizes this functional. And it's this one. It's, uh, and this is called the Bayes optimal classifier. And this Bayes optimal classifier is one to one with what, you know, frequentist statisticians might know as the uh, more, you know, more familiar, uh, be more familiar with, which is a likelihood ratio which you know from the Nyman Pearson lemma is the optimal way to separate uh, you know, two hypotheses um, or test two hypotheses. So this is all great, but it's, you know, this is like in principle what you would do, but I don't know these distributions, right? That I'm, I'm, if I'm in an implicit setting, I don't have the, these, I can't you know, evaluate these things, but I can sample from those models. Uh, and so I can approximate this loss function with uh, the, the empirical expectation. Um, and so I just generate a bunch of red dots and a bunch of blue dots uh, and so I can effectively approximate this loss function. Um, and then I can use a neural network to parameterize S and I can approximate this, uh, this uh, optimal classifier. So that's the basic setup. Um, here are the two classes that I'm trying to, uh, you know, distinguish are, are fixed. They're just cats and dogs. Um, in my simulation based inference setting, usually I have a continuous family of hypotheses that I want to test. But I can take the same logic and sort of lift it into this continuous uh, space 
uh, where I have a, the family that's parameterized by theta. Um, and I can pick any two points in this parameter space, call them theta naught and theta one. And then I can just think about the likelihood ratio between those two points. Um, and, and so this is a perfectly well-defined thing. And I can try to get a neural network to try to learn this likelihood ratio uh, as a function. So it depends on the data, but it also depends on the parameter values for theta naught and theta one, the two hypotheses I'm comparing. Um, so I call this kind of a neural network that depends on both the data and the parameters of parameterized classifier. Um, and you could also, you know, get rid of the dependence on the, the parameter theta one here and just compare to some fixed reference so that the, you only have uh, the parametric dependence in the, in the numerator. Uh, and that will also work, you know, perfectly fine if, you know, given that the, this reference distribution sort of well, well behaved. Okay, so that's the sort of picture for supervised learning. And I hope you get a, a little bit of a flavor of how that works. Uh, for unsupervised learning, you can follow sort of a similar story. Uh, there's a loss functional uh, that in principle, uh, you, would, you, would, uh, you would want to uh, minimize. In practice, you're going to approximate that with uh, you know, the, the, uh, the empirical version of that, which just looks like maximum likelihood. So it's like a maximum likelihood fit. You need your model that you're fitting Q to be normalized to one. And if you have that, excuse me, if you have that, then, uh, then the Q function that you learn will approximate the density that you actually want. Uh, and then you can train this if you have a bunch of pairs of, of the parameter value theta and the data X, where the data that you generated, you know, was generated with the corresponding value of that parameter. Uh, then you can uh, learn a, a conditional density, uh, you know, Q of X given theta or vice versa, Q of theta given X. Um, in this situation where you, you learn Q of X given theta, you don't really care how you generated the parameters theta as long as you sort of cover, you know, cover all the bases. Uh, it, it, so you don't really need to think of this as a prior distribution. You can think of it as just some proposal distribution used for training the model. Now, so that's again, just to give you a quick flavor of how that works. Now, in both of these cases, sample efficiency is like a major concern. You have to run the simulator a bunch of times to generate the synthetic data to train these things. Um, and it can be very inefficient. And so one thing that we realize is if you go inside of the simulators, uh, you open up the black box, uh, you can often extract some more information from the simulator uh, that you can use for training. So your loss function is not going to just use the synthetic data X, it's also gonna use some augmented, augmented training data to make the, the, the learning more efficient. And so I'll give you just a quick feel of what, what I'm talking about. So, um, so the simulator is encoding the distribution of the observed data X and the latent variable Z. And while this, this marginalization integrating over all the latent variables is intractable, if you don't do that integral and you, you, know, you, you think about things jointly in terms of, you know, for some simulated event, you have the observed data and the latent variables, then oftentimes the likelihood ratio, the joint likelihood ratio, where you, you also consider what happened to the the latent variables is tractable. So you can basically say, here's some simulated event with every, the whole history of how it was generated and say, would it, you know, what, how much more likely would this event have been under you know, theta naught compared to theta one? Um, and similarly, you can oftentimes the joint score is also tractable where you take the gradient of the log likelihood, uh, in, again, including the latent variables. And so if these quantities are tractable, uh, then you can you can design some loss functions that will take advantage of them. And so I'm not going to go through the details carefully here, but basically you want to convert this joint likelihood ratio into the this other likelihood ratio, and that's not so trivial. Um, but if you it turns out if you just simply do like least squares re regression, uh, that you can show that this least squares regression will be minimized by the likelihood ratio that you actually care about. Uh, and similarly, if you do that for the joint score, and you regress, you will get back to the, uh, the score function that you actually care about. And this, this thing is very powerful from like, a, is like connected to a lot of classical statistics and you know, sufficient statistics and things like that for how to estimate parameters. Um, so when you put all this together, instead of having just kind of this binary cat versus a dog binary label, you have this very rich training data, which allows you to train with orders of magnitude less data uh, training data, you can get, you know, improve the accuracy of how well you approximate the, uh, the likelihood function. So, uh, so this has been very effective uh, and, and has, you know, made some of these, uh, you know, these techniques practical in situations which would otherwise be too computationally expensive. <clears throat> okay, so let's pause. I know I'm talking fast and going through a lot of material. 
But what I want to recap is that we, first I talked about the sort of what, like what kinds of capabilities are we talking about? I talked briefly about how that works from a machine learning point of view. And now I want to kind of take a step back and think about why, like what, why are we doing this in the broader like scientific uh, context? And, and in that, I also want to kind of broaden the, the questions that we're asking uh, from like statistical inference questions to maybe more like uh, design questions, like experimental design. Um, and I'd also like to connect this now to things like reinforcement learning. So I'm, I'm guessing that probably many of you are familiar, you know, roughly with the idea that like reinforcement learning has been used like AlphaGo to play, you know, chess and Go and various games that uh, now superhuman, you know, capabilities. Um, and when you do this, you basically have some sort of reinforcement learning agent that's making some action, like deciding what move to take. Uh, and they interact with an environment, which would be like the board and the other player. Um, the environment will respond, like the, uh, you know, the other player will make a move. Um, then you have something that sort of interprets the state of you know, the new state, and then can give the agent some sort of reward, and then update the state. You know, like you're now, your board is in a different state than it used to be. Um, now, schematically, uh, this- Just yes? a quick reminder, uh, we're about 10 minutes before Q&A. Okay, yeah, I think we're good. Um, so the, uh, so the, the, the uh, what do I want to say? The, so you can think of this as like roughly analogous to like what's happening in the scientific method with a, you have some agent that's trying to decide what experiment should you perform next. Uh, you perform that experiment, uh, that's interacting with the environment, you actually gather new data. The interpreter is basically doing the statistical analysis based on that new data. The updated state is essentially going from like the prior to a posterior or something like that. Um, and you can formalize all of this in the language of statistical decision theory, where the, what the agent is doing is basically trying to learn a decision rule, which is you know, based on some data, what action should you take? And based on that action, you're going to have some kind of loss function or reward uh, that, you're, that you're trying to optimize. Now, uh, in the context of like, you know, doing experiments, you could say, okay, well, what is, the, what is a natural uh, objective that I would be trying to optimize? Well, one of them would be, I want to perform the experiment which I'm, where I'm gonna learn the most, right? So I have like a current state of knowledge, you can call that a prior. And then I'm gonna think about all the possible experiments that I could do. And for each one of them, if I could simulate what would happen, I could imagine what the posterior would look like afterwards. And I can, uh, and I can imagine that expect the information gain from going from the prior to the, that posterior. And then, you know, what's the expected value of that information gain? Uh, and then I scan over all the possible experiments that I might do, and I find the one that's going to optimize the expected information gain. So that's a possible uh, setup. And here's like a little figure for that. You have the experiment that you're performing. This box is the typical Bayesian inference approach where you stick in data and a prior. You have a Bayesian update that spits out a posterior. Um, and then you try to figure out what experiment should I do next. And you have this expected information gain optimization loop. Once you decide, then you have a new experimental configuration that goes here, and then you perform the new experiment and you sit in that loop. So I tried a few years ago to try to like, you know, uh, like actually code this whole thing up uh, in the simulation-based inference setting. Uh, remember that the expected information gain itself involves uh, calculating the posterior for some, some, you know, some synthetic data. So you have a, a little Bayesian loop sitting inside here, and both of these involve simulation-based inference. So this can get to be computationally very intensive, uh, but was able to kind of code this whole thing up. Uh, and, um, and I call that kind of coined that uh, phrase, you know, active sciencing here. It's basically experimental design, but we were using active learning to kind of efficiently scan through the different experimental configurations that you might use. Um, and we applied this to you know, a particular particle physics context where the parameter that I wanted to measure was what's called the Weinberg angle that dictates how the photon and the Z boson are, are uh, a superposition of each other. Um, and then I consider different experiments that I might do and that were parameterized just by the beam energy and if the beams were polarized or not. And uh, if you've studied this problem in particle physics, you know that as you scan the, the beam energy, there's a, a, a particular observable uh, or you know, a summary statistic that you can consider called the, the cosine of the angle of one of these muons. And it's sensitive to uh, both the, the Weinberg angle and the energy of the, the collision. And if you also, if you look at the equations, you can see that uh, when you sweep the beam energy or the center of mass energy through the, the resonance of the Z boson mass, uh, 
that you get this kind of, uh, it's like pushing, a, you know, it's like a, a driven resonance or something. And when you're right on the resonance, you don't really have any effect, but just above or just below the effect, you're sensitive to what's going on. And so you can look at the equations and, and figure out like what's a good experiment to do if you're a traditionally trained physicist, or you can hand off this to an algorithm. And what we, we saw was the, the, here's the expected information gain as a function of the experimental design parameter, which was the center of mass energy. And we saw that there's a dip when you're right on the resonance, but just above or below the resonance that we, you know, the expected information gain is maximized. And so we were able to have this algorithm that would sort of design what experiment should I do next to measure this quantity. And so I thought that this was like, you know, pretty interesting and cool and it's starting to get into like, you know, deeper into the scientific loop. Um, and so I remember posting about this and Danilo Resende of like BAEs and normalizing flows was, you know, said he thought this was cool. Uh, you sort of have the whole scientific method in a loop. But I guess my point here that I would make is that this works, but it works in this very kind of uh, confined setting where uh, the types of experiments that I might do, I've already thought about what kind of experiments that I'll do. And I just have like one or two parameters that I'm scanning over, like the beam energy. Um, and I also, the space of theories that I'm testing is also already defined. I only have uh, like one or two parameters that I'm trying to measure. And, and even in this very restricted setting, it was still hard enough. And if you want to take this to the next level where you actually start getting into like open world of experimental design, like what kind, like should I build a particle collider or should I send a telescope into space? You know, this very open world of experimental design, this is not gonna scale very well at all. Um, and similarly, if I wanna go to an open world of hypotheses, it's also not gonna work very well. Like, you know, if I, um, and so if you start thinking about like hypothesis generation, you start to appreciate just how hard that problem is, uh, especially if you want to approach it with these kinds of tools. Um, so this now takes me to these kind of like cartoons of the scientific method um, and where you see, you know, like, okay, you know, this kind of, you know, high school or middle school level, you know, discussion of what's going on. But most of what I talked about uh, so far just sits really on this arrow. Like once I've decided what experiment to do and I've gathered the data, I would like to like test those predictions and do like hypothesis testing or something. And simulation-based inference is essentially sitting here. And in the bigger scope, it's a pretty small slice of the pie. If I wanted to develop new theories or try to think about what's a good question to ask, formulate new hypotheses, try to think about what types of experiments are going to be sensitive to them, you know, this is hard. And right now, humans are really responsible for doing this. And you also see in the text here things like, you know, why questions and questions about the underlying mechanism. That's where you know, ca causal inference, be, you know, plays more and a more and more important role. Um, and so that's where you get into, if you wanted to actually be able to learn the underlying physical principles, you need to work in this broader open world of possible hypotheses. And that's, that's just very challenging, basically. Um, and so if you wanted to try to understand kind of a little bit about what's going on there, um, part of the point is that most of the machine learning that we were, I think that we're taught and exposed to is cast where you know, you would be able to essentially solve the problem if you had access to an infinite amount of training data, because that would mean that you have essentially the joint distribution over, for instance, the data and the labels or whatever joint distribution you want, you would have access to. But in this uh, causal hierarchy, this, uh, this type of association level uh, of, you know, joint probabilities is really the lowest thing on the rung, the, the rung of the causal hierarchy. Um, and that if you wanted to ask deeper questions, you need to be able to intervene and you need to be able to have this causal model and answer questions like, what would happen if I do this? And with the simulator, I'm able to answer those questions. What would my data look like if my you know, collider energy was blah, 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 right? Uh, you don't learn, you, you learn that by sort of, in, you know, you need to be able to intervene. Um, and there are also higher level questions of counterfactuals and things like this. So many scientific questions can really, are really, uh, above this association level, they get into counterfactuals and interventions. And I just like to, you know, for the, my physics colleagues that haven't really appreciated this, just underscore how important causal inference is in the story. Um, so there's some simple examples here that try to show how uh, doing interventions uh, is different. Here's three scenarios that have the same joint distribution, where when you intervene on them, you get different distributions for like the variable Y. So it's not the same as conditioning. Um, so it's a nice example to look at. Um, and there's a point from the kind of machine learning, you know, uh, vanguard that is starting to appreciate more and more that, you know, bringing in the causal uh, mechanism is important for, for uh, sample complexity, you know, uh, robustness to domain shift, like uh, uh, 
you know, systematic uncertainties and things. Um, and, uh, and then there's also this point, and I realize I'm not going to, I'm running out of time, but uh, Peter Battaglia has talked about, uh, you know, when you get into model building, that it's, you know, this idea, idea of being able to take smaller kind of building blocks and, and compose them together and is in this kind of a combinatorial generalization is very important for like, you know, longer term intelligence. Um, and recently, there's also been some theoretical work trying to kind of formalize this uh, under the, the term uh, algorithmic alignment, uh, where there's some, you know, kind of theoretical results about how important it is to try to have neural network modules that sort of align with the different uh, sort of subroutines or causal mechanisms of, of uh, the data generating process. Okay, so I, in my last minute, I'll just kind of finish up. So I had various examples here, which uh, uh, I talked too slowly, so uh, I didn't really get to, which were basically trying to be explicit about examples of these types of inductive bias and where they've been useful. And the, the main message basically is that, you know, I think the pendulum is swinging back. And I think you'll see that in, in Francois' uh, uh, talk about the, the importance of these hybrid, you know, physics aware approaches. Uh, where either you take the traditional simulation chain and you try to, you know, add capabilities to them like automatic differentiation or probabilistic programming, or you try to build neural network architectures that kind of reflect the underlying mechanism. Um, and, uh, and there's, you know, increasing evidence that doing so basically helps in, in, a, in a number of ways. And so there are examples here that I don't have time to go through where, you, for instance, graph neural networks where the architecture is based off of kind of what you would expect and they're able to generalize to systems they've never seen before, uh, different types of generalization where we put in bottlenecks related to, for instance, the fact that we know there's like some Hamiltonian, you know, ODE type of story in the background. And that helps. Uh, observations here that that align, that kind of, you know, echoes these points about algorithmic alignment. Uh, we had some work where we then tried to, do, you know, pair this with symbolic approaches. So we learn a dynamical system with a graph neural network the graph neural network has the right kind of causal structure. And then from that, we apply regularization to try to fo force a like Occam's razor, you know, minimal bottleneck. And then we run sim uh, symbolic regression and we actually are able to extract like the underlying force laws. Um, so if you wanted to get to, you know, underlying mechanisms, I think these are just kind of cool examples. Uh, they're simple examples, but they're, they're pointing to that. Um, I have an example with jets that I unfortunately don't have time to get to, but again, there's it's just pointing to this tree and IN architecture is it, the architecture of their neural network uh, has a dynamic programming algorithm inside of it. So it like dynamically makes the architecture of the neural network uh, that reflects the actual showering process of the underlying you know, physics mechanism. And we see very good performance with very few parameters and these train with very little data. Um, where there's a similar version that's a generative model where you see alignment between the latent variables of this deep learning surrogate from the latent variables in the actual physics simulator, uh, which is again another manifestation of this alignment idea. Um, and there are observations that kind of, you know, key on to this idea that uh, instead of learning the nonlinearities of your neural network, maybe you can encode them in the architectures themselves. Um, and uh, yeah, and so that's basically the main message. And I'll just I have these concluding slides, and I'll just I'll just read this one slide that, you know, I started off by talking about how the simulators are based on well-motivated mechanistic models, uh, but they they lead to these very, you know, intractable inverse problems. That's kind of where we started. Then there was the point that machine learning is giving us this ability to learn some effective model that relates the underlying mechanism to the kind of macroscopic emergent phenomena, and that's very important. But those models need not, like, reflect the underlying causal structure. And if we want to go the next level and really have something like a robot, you know, scientist that can like generate new hypotheses and think efficiently about what experiments are going to be effective, then we probably need to embrace some type of hybrid approach and, and particularly where the architectural components uh, somehow align with the causal mechanism. And I think that that's like a very exciting, fun area of research. And thank you for your attention. Well, thanks so much for a really interesting talk. Looks like you need a follow-up talk on all the ideas at the end. Yeah, so, apologies for going fast at the end there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we, we, we're good with time. We have uh, uh, plenty of time for questions also. So, uh, oh, uh, <laughs> I don't know who was first. Uh, we can start with Marcus. Hey, Kyle. Thank you so much for this very interesting talk. Um, I have a question regarding um, 
ähm, äh, die uh, so, so Uh, um, regarding simulation-based inference and in which areas of um, you know physics this is um, this is useful. So you know, uh, for instance, I work in an in an area where I have a lot of data, but one problem that I have is um, that my models that I fit are uh, can be non-identifiable. Yeah. So um, <laughs> so th there are I think about about it like you know three failure modes. Either either you have two less data. Um, or your model is just wrong, right? So you have model misspecification, or you have a lack of identifiability, right? So the, these are like like three three problems. Yeah, I have all I, I have the second two, right? I have enough data, but I have these two. So I can imagine that like simulation based inference is is is, is very useful in the case where you know your modeling isn't just so your, your traditional modeling right it isn't isn't very good either your likelihood is is hard to get a, a exact or your 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 theoretical model is is just very inexact right so you can you can really model the the, the data generating process and and perform inference with that um i'm i'm a bit, little bit um so so assume you know you have lack of identifiability so you you just have you know you have like three different simulators yeah from three different groups that you know don't like each other and and yeah. you know each of them <laughs> produces a different uh, different uh, you know result so what what is the what is the current state of the art of you know do model averaging you know averaging of, uh, of hypothesis uh, in this area right yeah, no, it's a great question, and in, in other talks, I spend uh, quite a bit more time talking about uh, the the misspec model misspecification issues and things like that. One, uh, you know, ironic, I would say, observation is that when I talk about uh, simulation-based inference, I, is when I get the most questions about model misspecification because I think somehow people become very aware of the shortcomings of the simulators and their ability to model the data. Uh, and it's, it's, the thing that's ironic about it to me is that if you compare, what is that being compared to? Like, if you were to use some kind of very simple parametric form to describe your data or something, like most likely, you know, you have more realism in the simulator than you do in whatever simple formula that you can write down. So, in some sense, you're go, you're moving in the right direction, uh, but at the same time, uh, there's this tendency to want to use more, get, try to get more out of the data. You're working with you know, lower level data, higher dimensional data. So you might be more and more sensitive to subtle mismodeling effects than if you kind of give up on that and you try to just like pick a summary statistic that you think is robust and model that. And physicists are pretty good at doing that. Like, you know, like how it is that we intuit good variables that are generally robust to a lot of these things is a good question. But um, but I, so I guess the first thing I would just say is keep in mind that like usually the simulators are putting more and more realism in and there's nothing say, saying that you can't still use a simple uh, uh, summary statistic if you want. You know, you can, you, can, you can avoid using high dimensional data if you want. Um, then there's just the same set of things, same set of considerations that if you have misspecification, you need to deal with that. And like that problem is not going away. And there, you know, uh, and so you have all of the, all of the, Consideration. So either you add more expressivity to your model through adding nuisance parameters and more and more flexibility, or you have some kind of you know model selection uh, thing that you need to do. And there, I would say that roughly you would just follow the same sets of things that you would do it, when you confronted with that problem when the likelihood is tractable, and you just have an extra set of problems associated to it that the likelihood is intractable. <laughs> so, but a lot of those conceptual problems aren't really changed. In terms of the lack of identifiability, you know, you know, you in some sense that just means like your posterior or your likelihood has like a flat direction, and maybe that's just the answer, you know. And and as long as your inference tells you that you have that flat direction, then you know you know that it's non-identifiable in that particular way. So I'm not trying to like hide from any of these things. I just think that most of those are conceptual problems that appear even when the likelihood is tractable. And this is uh, and. When the likelihood's intractable, it doesn't really change, I think, in any significant way how you know you approach those problems. Can I ask a very quick follow-up question to uh, regards to that? So I completely agree with that with that assessment. Um, one one question that I have is, you know, at the end of the day, what we really care about is, of course, uh, coverage, right? So we would like to have. Um, you know, credibility intervals, or uh, if you are a Bayesian statistician, or um, you know, confidence intervals. If you are a frequentist, you know, when you have either, you know, when you have multiple experiments, you know, they 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 contain. So so these credibility or confidence intervals have uh, you know really contain the 
quoted number of, of you know true outcomes or you know sure, sure. so um so what is the um uh, so so what what, what is the um so with simulation based approaches and you mentioned that already uh, you you might you might run into computational you know shortcomings that can be partially alleviated by including more nuisance parameters about the you know experiment yeah. but uh, so so i mean have you uh, are there any studies to compare you know the coverage of 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 simulation based approaches applied to complex physics problems compared with you know um, you know with uh, yeah. in, in, in that context. That yeah. Yeah. so yeah. Th there are um, yeah so i mean when you once you get done trying to learn this likelihood ratio, I mean, you could take it for granted that you learned it properly, and then you could invoke some asymptotic properties or something like that, and, and get out a result. But you know, as pointed out, it may not have the, the proper uh, coverage or calibration issues, um, and that may be because you did a bad job of learning, or it may just be because you're not in this asymptotic regime. Um, so you can just generate more <laughs> data and calibrate the things. And so Anne has some work doing that. I have some work doing that. Um, and again, like organizationally, the situation does not really change. The coverage will be with respect to the simulator. So if the simulator is not accurate, you know, then you don't, you can't say that it covers for some other model. Uh, but but you again, you can follow, I think, the rough uh, uh, idea. So I'll stop Thanks. there since I see yeah. Matt and just yeah, Matt is next, and then Jesse. So Matt. Uh, yeah. Hi, Kyle. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. I just have a quick question on. Uh, handling priors on theta in in the likelihood learning. So right. uh, effectively, my question boils down to uh, how sensitive or insensitive is is your learning of the approximate likelihood to priors imposed on the training data that you're simulating? Yeah. And so I assume yeah, you need great, to. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So that you know, I talked, I put an emphasis on these amortized approaches where you sort of learn once and for all, and then you do inference. The, the other side of that are if, if you're not going to have a lot of data coming in or you don't have IID data, you just have one data set and you want to do inference, then there are sequential approaches. And the way that they work roughly is that you, you know, you get you generate a you have a, a rough guess, you generate some stuff, you get a, an improved guess, and then you refine and you only run simulators kind of in the relevant regions of the parameter space. And you see there that you know that you can get you know substantial improvement for the same computational budget if you take a sequential approach, uh, but uh, but then it's kind of not amortized. So depending on if you have like lots of IID data or you need to be fast, uh, you can definitely win by uh, having a more adaptive, active learning type approach to how you, how you uh, this kind of prior proposal. So, uh, but it's very, it becomes very problem specific, uh, roughly. <laughs> okay. But there's, okay, a, there's a nice, there's some benchmarking papers from uh, Jacob Mackey's group that try to address exactly that question. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Jesse? Hi, thanks, Kyle. So uh, this story of machine learning being like applied calculus of variations, uh, which you told me about a number of years ago, kind of helped convince me and being comfortable with machine learning. And, and I'm, right. I'm, I'm curious about this kind of, let's say, moving into this, um, uh, this algorithmic alignment picture. Is it just apply calculus of variations with Lagrange multipliers that are enforcing some physical picture, or is it something deeper or, or different than that? Like, how should I kind of conceptualize what algorithmic alignment kind of is in this applied calculus of variations language? That's a fantastic question. I think that there, are, I mean, I think it gets to be very complicated, but but roughly, I would say that there's two two ingredients, and the two ingredients interact. Uh, the first ingredient is that you're restricting the the space that, that you're you know that you're considering um so in that sense it's like lagrange multipliers and you just have a subspace of models that hopefully is still flexible enough to you know encompass the right solution um but the uh but the other thing has to do with uh, the the difficulty of learning right so for instance in a situation like this if you you know if you know these tree tree based models you know you could put uh, like the, you have some nonlinearity here but the question that kind of also is like, how expressive is that nonlinearity? If you only hit that nonlinearity once and it's just like a, a sigmoid or something, it's, it doesn't have enough capacity to describe like, you know, the, the underlying physics of what's going on. And, and, and so for instance, if this tree is wrong, you're gonna need some more capacity to try to describe that, right? So, so there's, a, there's some interaction between how the, the architecture choices and the expressivity of the nonlinearities themselves. But then there's this point, which I didn't really talk about at all, but uh, Linka, who is a statistical physicist, but is mainly using tools from statistical physics to understand the theory of learning, you know, like how hard is it to learn and you get like lost, lost landscapes and, you know, like glassy systems and things like that. 
So she'll do things like, let's, uh, how hard is it for a neural network to learn another neural network? Um, and there, you know, a lot of her point is that there's this very non-trivial interaction between the structure of the data, the architectures and the implicit, the inductive bias of the architectures, and then the dynamics of the learning algorithm itself, like gradient descent and atom, you know, natural gradient. And so they all start to interact in some complicated way. So I think sometimes that 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 algorithmic alignment is, uh, gets whenever it hits the the learning algorithm, uh, it becomes very difficult to study. <laughs> and so at that point, it kind of, uh, you, you know, uh, yeah. So I think both both things are present. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, um, getting close to an, oh, there's one more question. Last one, uh, Xiaosheng. Oh, okay, to... thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for your, thank you for your talk. And I have a very um, um, naive question. So as for the simulation based um, inference, I'm wondering um, uh, if we could find a way to decide when we have got, when we have uh, got the final accurate enough uh, likelihood because as we know, the network has some variations, you know? So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I think I understand the question to be that basically once you've done this uh, learning, how do you know if you actually learn the right likelihood, especially since it's intractable? So I think the two, the two rough answers to that are one, uh, you, can, you can say, you can give up on that, not necessarily the real likelihood, it's just some function. Uh, that's pretty good, and the, and I'm going to calibrate sure that I have good uh, confidence intervals, even though I went, didn't actually learn the likelihood ratio. Um, so that's one thing you can say. It's kind of safety. Uh, the other thing that you can do is that there are a number of like closure. You know, there are a number of conditions that should be satisfied. Like the expectation of the score should be zero. If you really learn the likelihood ratio. You should be able to reweight from one distribution to another in a way that you can't tell the, two, the reweighted distribution from the target. So you can train a classifier to see if you can tell the difference between them. Uh, there's all sorts of different kinds of things you can do that, uh, to try to diagnose if, the, like, if you've learned the likelihood. And they're all kind of uh, necessary, but not sufficient. But there are diagnostics around that you can use. Um, and in the end, you basically have this fallback about calibration, I think is like roughly the way I would state that. Okay, thank you. Okay, hey, uh, thanks so much, uh, Cal, for uh, an amazing talk. Uh, we're thank getting you. close to the next session. Uh, so I'd like to uh, thank Cal again, as well as our CMU facilitators, uh, Mike Stanley, hosting on mobile ed, Andreas Campos, and Marcus Rao for helping out. And we'll take a short break and continue again at 12.15. Thank you so much. Someone has to store the, the chat. That's important, not that everyone leaves. <laughs> okay.